my understanding is that Brian talks a lot about the algorithm that he does not trust his mind, mm. but he lives um, according to the algorithm. But who writes that algorithm? My understanding is that uh, he, ha he has a team of scientists who are writing that algorithm that Brian follows. And my understanding is that you are the scientist boss, meaning yeah. <laughs> you are the highest level of the dominance hierarchy of Brian Johnson. Is that true? Welcome everyone. Today I have Oliver Zolman, founder of 21 Consulting. And since we all know that there can be only 21 million Bitcoin in the world, that's why many Bitcoin companies use the name 21 in their names. So Oliver, as you can guess, is a financial analyst. So my first question to you is, where do you see the Bitcoin price being at the end of this year? It was very low last year, so hopefully a little bit higher. A little bit higher. Ten percent higher. I'll be happy. <laughs> All right, you're coming on on with it. That was a joke. Oliver is uh, actually. What's your what's what's your trade? Can you introduce yourself? Tell me about twenty one. About twenty one, right? Yeah, so it's a, a consultancy company I started during medical school in back um, 2016. I think I was in third or fourth, yeah, third year of medical school then. Uh, so about halfway through in the UK system. Yeah, it was designed to rewrite the clinical guidelines uh, for different medical conditions so that they were more, uh, more up to date, included um, studies which had been missed or therapies and tests that weren't available locally, but were available elsewhere. Um, trying to solve a bunch of issues with the current guidelines for specific medical conditions. And then using those on clients in a one-to-one -one way uh, to try and improve the results that they were getting currently uh, with, their, with the existing healthcare system that they were using. And normally that was in the UK or USA, they're the most two common places. All right, and uh, and I've also seen longevity school. That's a, that's a separate project of yours. Yeah, so longevity school is kind of um, the way of uh, like putting all those guidelines together in a structured way and focused on uh, longevity, so age-related conditions mostly as well. Um, so that is directed at clinicians initially, so training clinicians, uh, because it's quite complicated, you know, clinical guidelines, they're not really designed for individuals to understand. Uh, it's more for doctors or, you know, specialist clinicians. And you need, you, know, you also need access to uh, like prescribing uh, capabilities, uh, understanding all, all, of the, all the medical school stuff as well. So it's quite complicated to teach these things to, to individuals. But yeah, it's uh, initially the first version is for clinicians and it's all the guidelines that I've been using on clients like, uh, like Brian or um, other people uh, in US and UK mostly as well. You touched on Brian there, which uh, which probably your final piece of introduction here. So my understanding is that Brian talks a lot about the algorithm, that he does not trust his mind. Mm. but he lives um, according to the algorithm. But who writes that algorithm? My understanding is that uh, he, ha he has a team of scientists who are writing that algorithm that Brian follows. And my understanding is that you are the scientist boss, meaning yeah. <laughs> you are the highest level of the dominance hierarchy of Brian Johnson. Is that true? Well, yeah, it's, it's basically my, <laughs> is, yeah, it's, so my, my longevity school guidelines have been around for a long time. Um, you know, back in 2016 was when I, when I started these, writing these things. And yeah, so I, I you know, I've, I've been doing it for years already. Um, I bring in experts 
um, as required for um, you know individual clients because uh, you know sometimes people have rare conditions um, that or you know everyone's a bit different and you often need a specialist just for that that kind of person as well so you know everyone has some genetic conditions probably or some kind of anatomical variation or um, or just like personal preferences or, or unusual conditions there's always something in someone and for those you need a you need a, a specialist relevant to them as well so yeah for each, each client that goes through this process you're you're always needing to, to bring in new specialists if you really want to get super deep into um into their health okay. but yeah it's okay. um the, the guidelines uh you know they're primarily written by me um over the past you know eight eight years or so and um but then each one is peer reviewed by uh by the by the relevant you know expert in the area just like with papers or, or normal clinical guidelines so when you write a clinical guideline it has to be peer reviewed um by by experts and sometimes by patients as well it's good to involve them in the guideline writing process but yeah it's, so it's a mix of doctors phds and patients that help help peer review uh the guidelines Let's 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 move on to the topic of today, which is uh, rejuvenation Olympics. What's the story? <laughs> um, I think I was the first person to create the field of um, competitive rejuvenation um, in a biostatistically accurate, reasonably accurate way. So I started this around 2017, 2018. And I have the Zolman Rejuvenation Leaderboards uh, for that. And that's, that's related to um, my, uh, in my, my ways of measuring biological age as well, which are the Zolman clocks, which are, are coming out soon. It's, yeah, initially, so I made these leaderboards because I was frustrated with seeing people online uh, saying, doing all these pseudoscience therapies or, you know, or dodgy therapies or even, even legitimate therapies, but then not publishing their results, um, either like casually, informally, or even like in a more formal biostatistical, uh, biostatistically accurate way, or even more formally in like a, in a study, like a case report, case series, or, um, or, or proper trial. So it was my frustration there, seeing that um, people were just kind of saying stuff and expecting you to believe it, and kind of a lot of snake oil, oil sales people. Um, so then I was like, okay, why not make people actually show their markers in a way that these that are good markers as well, not just random markers, and do that independently verified, um, and get around all the possible ways of tricking, you know, submitting fake results or or whatever, or someone else's results as well. That's another way of getting around it. And, um, and then also doing this in like a biostatistically ac accurate way as well. So it's like using the best markers in the most accurate way um, and like uh, in, in a non-fraudable way as well and making it fun um, and accessible at the same time. So yeah, I had these, I, I've got these Zolman rejuvenation leaderboards um, which have been around for a while and I started using different biological age markers on there um, and different, uh, different leaderboards for different kind of things. But then the issue there is it's very, it's very complicated and expensive to do these things. Um, because measuring, you know, it's measuring biological age is, is very tricky and it's not, it's, yeah, it's still very tricky. Uh, but it's one of the main things I'm working on in my research. Uh, but a way of doing that, uh, that's kind, kind of accurate and kind of easy to do, like it doesn't require complicated devices, it's just a blood test is this um, pace of aging uh, test by True Diagnostic. So there are downsides with that because it does vary quite a lot um, month to month. Uh, and also it's a very new marker, so it's not super validated, um, but it ha is based on a 45 year uh, data set of um, following people in different, um, in New Zealand, I think, uh, following them for 45 years. So that's one of the strengths to it. Uh, but it is also expensive as well. So, and you have to do it. So, because of these reasons that it changes quite a lot, uh, you have to do it at least three times really to take an average. So, you get your six and do that across over a six month time point. Because once you get past six months, 
uh, or 12 months, uh, you know, you're starting to get rid of the random variation that occurs with that marker. And you're starting to also, um, it's you're showing that you're maintaining a, a certain level. So that's going to be more predictive of what your level is going to be over, over even a longer period of time. So it's important to not just do a one, one time point thing and then rank people on that because they can have a good day or a bad day and the result will be completely different the next week. It's about taking the average of a good period of time that's kind of clinically relevant um, and then ranking people based on that. So yeah, the reason I went with the, the true diagnostic one and built that, uh, built that leaderboard um, is because just the ease of doing it. Um, it's just a simple blood test. It's not, um, and it's e easy to access in USA. And there aren't issues between assay variation, which you get with um, even regular blood tests, like, uh, like uh, BNP is one, um, brain natriuretic peptide. That's something that's uh, released from the heart in, in heart damage and a few other things. But the problem with that is that you have to use the same assay between different BNP tests and different labs will use different kind of kits, different brands of BNP test. So then there's, doesn't, that makes it trickier to compare between people. But with, with this, yeah, with the true diagnostic one, it's just one provider. Uh, so you're always getting um, like the same, the same kind of, uh, there's, there's not that issue of inter, inter provider uh, accuracy. May, may, may I ask what are your stats here? Which bit? Stats, st statistics, uh, uh, chronological age, biological age, pace of aging, uh, mm. what, what you know? Oh, me personally? Yes. Good. Um, so it's not very accurate below age 30, 35. Uh, yeah, so again, this is another issue with biological age testing. Each marker kind of starts changing um, and becoming clinically relevant. It, it can change a little bit, you know, at young ages, some markers, but then they start changing a lot more uh, after a certain age. And this is different for each marker. So... Like most of the people you see on the leaderboard on this leaderboard, they're all like, you know, the top ranked people. I think they're all kind of, um, f you know, forty plus age age forty plus or forty five, yeah, forty forty five plus, and that's because you can then you can show a, a greater reduction a relative to your chronological age, because we're comparing the average of the of the um, of the pace score against the chronological age. But obviously, if you're young already, then you can't really go much younger. So it doesn't really rank very well. Um, and also, because aging doesn't really occur much until kind of 40 plus, really, uh, that you're not, it's not really a useful um, expenditure or a useful use of resources um, doing uh, that particular test at a, at a young age. So yeah, this test, again, like this leaderboard, it's more for age 40 plus. I think that's where... It may be clinically useful um, and predictive, but again, it's still a very, you know, it's an epigenetic marker. It's kind of a new field. This one, this exact pace has gone through various, you know, iterations, even in the past few years. So it's like a new version coming out each year. Uh, so it's still a very early stage. And, you know, my, my advice really is, um, like, you don't want to, if you had a 200 pound or dollar or euro budget, uh, you wouldn't want to be spending it all on this uh, ep epigenetic clock kind of stuff uh, because that's that doesn't make any sense at all. This is like a fun extra thing if you've got a, a lot of spare money um, to add in this test on, after you've done all the standard medical care stuff um, to see if it helps guide you in in some extra way. Because remember, you don't you can't you don't just measure it one time. You're trying to do it. You've got to do it several times to really um, kind of get an accurate reading as well. So yeah, you want to, that first 200, you know, because that's the probably the price of the test. It can be even more actually, like even $400 just for one of these tests if you're doing the whole panel with True Diagnostic. You wouldn't want to spend your only $400 on that. You'd want to do it on, you know, your, if it was testing, you'd want to do it on like a basic blood panel or, or um, you know, scales or maybe aura ring or, or sleep testing, depending on your, on your medical history. So let's zoom in. Um, explain to me the Dunedin pace clock, what, what is it actually measuring? Hmm. Slowly, I, I okay. will slow you down. <laughs> um, so there is a good explanation on their website. 
I think they got some pictures as well. It really so, tall. Yeah, d- definitely check that out. <laughs> but yeah, so, okay, simply. Uh, so pace, it's it's like all capitals. So I think it's yes. it, it's an acronym. I don't know what for, but yeah, it, it, oh, okay. but it's also not an acronym because they're trying to measure the pace of aging through if you have a, you get a score between 0.5 and 1.5 and if your score is around 1.1 i think that's the average it's not one it's a little bit different but yeah if your score is 1.1 that means you're aging at the average pace com- oh, well, yeah, the average speed compared to their reference population that they followed for 45 years in new zealand but if you have a score above okay. 1.1 then you're aging faster and below then you're aging slower okay so 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 how are we going to age backwards here a mathematics doesn't come out so if it starts <laughs> from 1.5 0.5 exactly you cannot yeah. go negative yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so this test doesn't work for assessing that um it's just a kind of prognostic risk factor so it's it's like predicting your your speed of aging relative to that cohort. It's not telling you whether you're getting younger or older. So it's a bit different. Okay. Yeah, it's like a it's not a marker that can tell you whether you're getting biologically younger. It's just showing how your whether your speed of aging is is changing uh, with age. Okay. So just to to understand for for those who did not try it. Uh, you take a little bit of blood and you send it to TrueDiag company and they tell you a bunch of things, but uh, but one of this is going to be your pace of aging from 0.5 to 1.5. Yeah. Um, now, what do they do with that, that, that blood? What's going on with that blood? Yeah. So they get, I think they get rid of the red blood cells and the white blood cells. And then they just take the white blood cells, and I think only a certain type of them, called PBMCs, they're the ones they use. So they, there's like a standard technique for isolating those. And you have these PBMCs, and then they're doing the test on them. And it's an epigenetic test, so they're measuring the epigenetics in these PBMCs, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, that is. And then they do the epigenetic test, and that's where they're reading... Sorry, the sorry, 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 sorry. Let me stop you there. Sure. Um, we have the blood, red blood cells. You take the red blood cells out and there are something called PBSCs that you take out of the red blood cells. Is it part of the red blood cells? Oh, and so then... I'll explain. So in the blood, you've got uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Yes. And so we're just taking... They take out the white blood cells and then they're just running the the uh, epigenetic test on the white blood cells oh white not the red yeah okay sorry yeah, white ones and then they so they look at just the just a certain type of white blood cells and yes, yes. then uh they measure the epigenetic uh test on on that one and that's where you're seeing uh you're looking at the methylation values on the dna within the within the white blood cells so you look at the, the uh-huh. genome, you look at chemicals on the DNA in the white blood cells, and depending on whether they're uh, a certain factor, like high or low, then uh, they add all those together in a, an equation, and they and then they tell you your your different scores in the in the report. It's quite complicated. All right, all right, thank you. If uh, we would have more time, I would have wanted to go at that with you. But uh, yeah. let me move on to another question. So Rejuvenation Olympics, right? Uh, now you have two leaderboards there uh, in the website, rejuvenationolympics.com. Um, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so there's, um, there's the absolute, well, yeah, there's the first one at the top, I think, is the reduction one. And that's... Um... That one's comparing the base your baseline score to your uh, to your follow up score. So we take an average of your baseline scores. Ideally, it should be three, but I think when we started it, their database there was there was no one that had three, um, and people only had two. So it's currently two, but we're going to transition to taking an average of three baseline ones. So the idea is you have a baseline, 
and then you start doing interventions, um, like different therapies, and then you have an after result. And it's the people with the biggest difference between the after result and the baseline that rank highest in, uh, in that um, uh, reduction leaderboard. Uh, then the second leaderboard is a bit different. That's just where we're taking the absolute... Sorry. Yeah. S sorry. So if I get get drunk, smoke a lot of cigarettes uh, exactly. yeah, and, 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 and get myself as... So that would work for, to, to get a good result. Yeah. In the that, first. That's why uh -huh. that's why the reduction leaderboard isn't very good. So that's why we have the second one. That's why we have the second one exactly. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the reduction okay. one's good if you don't cheat because it's kind of fun and you can see that you're going from before and after and and you know you didn't cheat. Um, but yeah, that but some people probably have cheated. There's no way of knowing. Uh, but that's why we have the absolute one anyway. And that one is yeah, just the whoever has the lowest average uh, score across at least, uh, and these are all always for at least six month time points. Cause like we were saying, you don't want to take a, a random point here and there and not, uh, not take the average of a, a good period of time. Uh, so whoever has the lowest across a, a six month period relative to what is predicted for their age, their chronological age, then they rank the highest. Which of the athletes do you, do you, do you know? Uh, can maybe can you tell tell a few things about some of the athletes that that you actually personally know? Uh, maybe yeah, yeah. will be a good uh, good teaser for what's to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of these people I don't know. Uh, I know obviously I know Brian as he's following my protocol, which is good. He'll be the final boss in this channel. <laughs> final boss, yeah, yeah. Uh, Diane Ginsberg, she is a... Or Ginsberg, not, not sure. Uh, yeah, she's, she's an, coming as well. Yeah, she's good. So the, the interesting thing is um, women have like a healthier, a longer health span and lifespan than men. And that's picked up in this test as well. So they have generally better oh. scores than men on average. And they... Yeah. So there's a question of whether to break up the leaderboards into men and women or not, because it's kind of good if you're, um, if you're, if you're a man comparing yourself to a woman, because then you're like, because women, we know women have better life expectancy and health expectancy, uh, on average. So that's why it's kind of good to compare to women if you're a man. Because you, you know that's a real thing. So you're comparing against something that isn't potentially a statistical error. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's getting into a bit bit complex on the statistics side. Who else do I know? Uh, hmm. A lot of these are private or anonymous as well. Like people can be on there, but they they can still be anonymous. But yeah, there's oh Jeffrey Gladden. He's another doctor, so he's got his own scores up there. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, he's coming as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, Peter Diamandis. He's got mm. some nice scores. Another doctor. So there's quite a few doctors on here, which is interesting. Um, mm -hmm, so yeah, the mm -hmm. three people I know that are on there are all doctors, PhDs. All right. When will be an update? Do you know? They they said April first, <laughs> but uh, there was no update. It may be. Yeah, 1st. I think they've been super swamped. I think they've got a lot of studies going on all the time. They're, they're doing so many studies. It's a, a great company, True Diagnostic. Uh, so they, I think, yeah, they might be delayed until I'd say May, May time, but hopefully soon. Right, hopefully. Yes, yeah, so this is one example of a leaderboard uh, that you can do. Uh, I'm going to be putting up more leaderboards on my website, um, updated version with some more, more uh, simple ways of doing it as well. Where? Um, uh, on my website, oliverzolman.com. Regarding rejuvenation Olympics. You do understand that this can be really big, you know, mm. you are creating a completely new sport. <laughs> Some, and, 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 and it has such a peculiar characteristics, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's a sport where you don't have to have age groups, like the older you are, the, right, the, the, right. the better, better yeah. you can get at it. Yeah, you know, that's true. You do, yeah, you do a little bit, like I was saying earlier, like the reason I'm not even testing this um, on on people 
underage kind of 40, uh, especially if they're healthy, is because, yeah, it's it's kind of an age 40 plus thing. But yeah, so yeah, as long, it depends on the marker, but yeah, there'll be like a, there's like a, there's an ideal range for each marker um, for it to be, start being measured as well. Do you have a vision here? Hmm. Well, yeah, you're doing some nice work by interviewing people and seeing what um, happens. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're just like getting some insights because that's that's why I made the field is because um, uh, I was yeah. So one is the frustration with people not being uh, transparent with their data, <laughs> and luckily I've encouraged people like Brian uh, to to uh, like do everything I say and like, uh, and publish every single data point, um, and like go the extreme opposite way, like publish everything, um, which is, which is great. And then, so these leaderboards kind of represent a middle ground between that where, cause like you can't analyze, you know, it's not all that data is nice, but you can't really analyze it, uh, and draw out useful insights, uh, cause it's hard to, it's hard to scale. Um, but when you have these leaderboards, which are focused around certain uh, goals, then you can start correlating people's protocols to what they do to um, to the to who's at the top of the leaderboard or the bottom of the leaderboard or the middle of the leaderboard. So yeah, there's a lot of other leaderboards I'm working on right now, and yeah, it'd be cool to to uh, to get that data and see who is who's got the youngest of. Um, on each leaderboard and then publish those results in peer reviewed journals as well. Yeah, I hope I can, I can get some things out, some, some surprising things out of the participants. You know, I've, um, I've read a book called the philosophy of games from T Nguyen. Uh, he's the mm. foremost uh, game philosopher in the field. And in that book, he presents a theory, which is that, uh, life can be constructed as layers of agencies and basically games. And whenever you choose a game, uh, you, you play, you play this, this game, you, you end up adopting an agency, you're a different person, and then you play another game and you're a different person. We are right now playing the game of, uh, of having a discussion, but as soon as we finish, we switch in our minds and become a different person and you're going to your appointment and I am going to order a pizza and, and, and mess up everything that I <laughs> worked towards. So, so what's, what's, what's the point here? The point is that games makes you a different person. Right. The motivational power of games is is, is extraordinary. There is nothing else that can motivate someone to, to pursue a goal like a game can. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it gets to the way that yeah, exactly that, that the normal yeah. rules, yeah. like you can't punch me in the face, except if we are playing <laughs> a game, let's say a kickbox yeah. game, like then that's yeah. the goal. So, yeah, so games yeah. can transcend ethics and laws and yeah. you know if you gamify the longevity space uh create this uh, this game then you might actually end up contributing to the field in a much larger way than you yeah. initially um I, it, that's, expected. That, that's where i made it as well because i, I love uh, I, was, I was saying another interview actually last year who are, they were asking about this is yeah because of competition i'm a very competitive person and um encouraging that sense of competition in other people it's like a great way to um make it more fun but also scientifically valid at the same time so i said i'm seeking value and where you can find value is what other people disagree with you on but you believe believe strongly so this is the contrarian question of peter thiel so my question to you is the contrarian question of peter thiel what mm. is the thing that most people disagree with you but you strongly believe to be the case um uh, 
Um, tough one, tough one. Let me think. Well, yeah, I, I think you know one of the major issues I'm trying to solve is um, measuring biological age accurately in each organ. Um, and people believe that's not possible. Uh, but yeah, I think I've found a way and I'll be, I'll be publishing on that soon. I know you said I didn't have any papers. It's because I only want to publish like really good papers, um, that not publishing for the sake of publishing. Yeah. I think people think you can't measure biological age accurately. Um, but I think you can, but it's a, quite different than the current, uh, the current methods right now. Yeah. You heard about symphony age? Symphony age. No. Okay, so True Diag said that uh, they, they, they are planning to replace the Needham piece with the Rejuvenation Olympics with Symphony Age, and Symphony Age is looking at different organs, the age of different organs. Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah, so again, it's epigenetic, so it's, it's, not, very, it's not very good, unfortunately, uh, right now. Um, as the true, true diagnostic have their own one as well uh, right now. Um, the, uh, the 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 organ specific age uh, for epigenetic testing, but it's yeah, I've been I've been using it, but it changes like twenty thirty years um, month to month. So I see. I see. yeah, it's very hard to measure something indirectly. Like epigenetics is very good for measuring age of the immune system because that's where you're using you're using the white blood cells to measure it uh but other things it's like yeah it's uh it's going to be almost impossible it's just not going to work for for super accuracy unfortunately you are in this world as an entrepreneur uh seeking to create value and you are looking for feedback from the market that uh, they give you money for something and what is that something what would you like people to to pay you money for <laughs> what's the most value that you can offer them um i mean yeah, obviously my work with blueprint where i designed the supplements there uh that's they're quite nice products potentially um as they iterate and get better uh, so that's, you know, that's some good value. I think, uh, longevity school is, is a very cool, um, concept because I think there's a big need for that, um, both for the general public and for clinicians and other stakeholders as well. So yeah, I think longevity school could be, could be very fun, but yeah, the clinicians version is very different from the mass market version and yeah. There's, there's still a while a while yet to get it off the off the ground. It's very complicated. All right. It was a pleasure talking to you.